All right, and I believe you have to uh, um, click yes on your screen when I do that. Okay, uh, so now let me just go over to my exciting dreaded PowerPoint share. All right, um, so as I said, I have 440 comments to go through. Um, so many. So I just pulled a few quotes out that I thought were indicative of where we were at. Oops, sorry. I want to go back. HPIC is part of what makes this a community rather than just a neighborhood full of strangers, one person commented. These are anonymous too. If you recognize yourself, um, congratulations. Ultimately, another person said, I'm good with anything that keeps the club intact and functioning as a hub for our community. The old club was quirky, but great. I see a real opportunity for community with a rebuild of the club, but only if we maintain the soul of HPIC, which makes where we makes what we love such a wonderful place. Another person commented, I personally think the structure was fine. However, the finishings, lighting and ceiling were a bit grungy, which kind of required someone to look past the funk to love it, which is I thought was very true. <laughs> and then uh, I want to my next one. This one is the one that drives me every day. I just don't want to be sad and disappointed every time I leave the house and come home. I'd like to see it repaired as soon as possible. It has sat apparently untouched since the fire. It turned from a cute community center to an eyesore and blight on the neighborhood. Believe me, we feel that and um, we are working as hard as possible to move this along. And then closing, I wanted to share this comment. We're living in such changing times, it's hard to know what will be coming, but I think a space that has some flexibility and can give the community a place to meet neighbors, create a space for fun, joy, learning, safety, and practical needs. It's a lot, but let's shoot for the moon. So I've done a few uh, visualizations of some of the other questions we asked for. Um, uh, this one was from, what does a community gathering place mean to you? So we shared all these results with the architects and we've kind of been looking through and trying to wait, um, you know, things that we hear a lot of people are commenting on, things uh, that, that kind of kind of come to the fore. Uh, that's a good one there, I think. Um, what did you think about the old HPIC building? What did you like? I'm sorry. So neighbor space, the stage, having kids, a corner bar, having events, um, lots of comments about that sort of thing. And then of course, when we asked the question, which parts of the old building did you wish were different? Again, the kitchen, the bathroom, the connection to the outdoor spaces, the ceiling, the bottleneck at the front door, lack of diaper changing. I mean, there was just, you know, the endless list. I think folks will recognize probably some of their thinking there as well. Um, and then uh, the question of what do you wanna see when you drive by the new HPIC building? And we were trying with this question to really strike at what do we see ourselves as a neighborhood being? Uh, who are we? Uh, what do we wanna to say to folks driving by, right? And this is uh, some of the answers that came out. Welcoming, an outdoor space, garden, more art, visibility, signage. Um, so a lot of these things, the beauty of Highland Park, um, these are some of the answers folks gave us. So that's, I'm gonna stop now because um, I'm just a, um, I'm just a intro person. So I'm gonna now turn the floor over to Matt and Jody um, and let them uh, go from here and uh, tell us about their ideas. Thanks. Thanks, Kay. Mm -hmm. and thanks, Julie and Rhonda and everybody on the on the HPIC team. We're super, super honored to be continuing. I hope everyone had a happy new year. I would like to keep saying that at least until the end, end of January. Um, and we also wanted to uh, shout out to Nikki, Nikki Sugihara and Emily Hagen from our office are here as well. So from the Whitman Estes design team. Um, and Emily lives in West Seattle. Nikki, Nikki lives in um, the ID, but we're trying to get her over here. So I will share screen. So 
Okay, so so Jody and I are going to go through, and and then you know Nikki chime in um, <laughs> as as needed here. So the the objectives of tonight, so the the agenda, what we're hoping to um, share and talk about are um, five main things. One, um, taking that community input from the survey and um, understanding what that means specifically to a building and site and outdoor space. So we tried to um, aggregate the common themes from the, from the survey and feedback kind of similar to uh, the word cloud that Kay presented and like what are some common, common elements that it felt like there were multiple people um, advocating for. So we are gonna go through some of those and then we'll look at some plan diagrams, so some general space arrangements, and we wanted to get feedback on um, thoughts about uh, relationships of the different program elements, the bathroom, the kitchen, the flex space, the entry, the doors, uh, and whether it makes sense to pretty much leave things where they were or rearrange things, or you know, what are the opportunities around spatial relationships. And then we'll look at some massing studies, so we have some initial um, options for ways that you could rebuild the building with different um, roof shapes and orientations. And we're not trying to um, settle on a design. We're not necessarily presenting a specific design per se. We're trying to show a spectrum of ways that one could rebuild the building and get some initial community feedback on, on the implications and pros and cons of going down certain directions. And then finally, we'll look at some uh, images of other community centers and public buildings and um, look for feedback on the look and feel of the materials, the spaces, the type of architecture and, and landscape design that those buildings have and what seems to be resounding and um, resonating with people. And then we'll talk about next steps and where we go from here. So we thought we, we thought Jody and I could go through it and then um, and then, and then kind of open the floor for discussion at the end, because there's a lot of specifics and different stuff that we thought kind of getting through all of it, and then we can go circle back through the presentation specifically. So for the community input, we um, found some common themes that were, um, that we were excited about and seemed like there were quite a few people mentioning that. The first one was indoor-outdoor connections. So the wonderful West patio and how can the building open up to that west patio, both visually and also have a, a zone where you could occupy and be both um, on the edge of the indoor space and the outdoor space and connect to the west patio as well as connecting to the street. Um, it was noted that the um, you know, Highland Park's becoming more of a, of a, needs to be more walkable. It's not very walkable right now. So having a more pedestrian scale um, indoor outdoor along Holden would be good. Uh, secondly, uh, inclusive and welcoming spaces. So the idea that it feels kind of like corner bar, like a you know beer star, coffee shop, um, library. You know, having it feel very comfortable and invite and inviting and welcoming, inclusive. So all types of people feel like they will be at home and can relax there. Uh, thirdly, higher ceilings, a more spacious volume, and better acoustics. So um, for the different music performances and events, having um, a more, a more positive, um, open feeling spatially, and also the way that sound travels and is contained could be improved in the new building. More natural light and open feel. So having um, opportunities for the um, more balanced light, more natural light coming in from different directions and just having a, a more feeling of spaciousness and light. Um, and then next, uh, right sizing of the new building. So what is the right, size, um, do we keep the same footprint? Do we build taller? Do you build for the future? Do you build a, a building that the community can grow into? So thinking ahead about what's the right size um, and how do you build on the opportunity for the future? Uh, and then finally, the civic identity, how to draw people in. It was noted that Highland Park brings in a lot of people from other parts of, C of West Seattle and adjacent neighborhoods, as well as the city at large. So I think the main, one of the most important questions for the meeting is, is what does Highland Park see itself um, as in terms of this building? How does the building want to speak to um, Highland Park's identity? Okay, so next we'll go into the plan diagrams. 
So one thing that uh, we see is very special about, about HPIC is that it sits at this nexus <clears throat> of, um, of travel paths. So it's one of the first, um, you know, so you see it when you come up from Highland Parkway. So people coming up from Georgetown, South Park Soto, up Highland Parkway, you know, when they turn on Holden, you know, there's several um, multifamily housing buildings and then you get to HPIC, that's kind of one of the first um, you know, non-housing buildings you see there. So it has a kind of opportunity to be a sort of gateway from the east. And it draws people, I think, equally from Georgetown South Park um, to the north as it does from White Center to the south. And then east west, you know, you have people coming in from, from West Crest and the, the um, east neighborhoods as well as the west neighborhoods around Delridge. So, so I think it's important to think about the opportunity that the building has within the larger neighborhood context. Then zooming in to the block itself. So this is the um, this is the block, the entrance from 12th Avenue uh, between 12th Avenue and the alley and um, Holden Street to the south. So some of our initial observations were around opportunities of these corners, which we touched on also in the last meeting that the, the southwest corner could be more inviting and have like a cafe kind of third place. Um, have that access the street more and that's where currently the the entry is between the west patio and the building so opening that up maybe that corner is the thing that people see when they're walking along the street and then the southeast corner coming in from from holden and highland park way could be more of like a neighborhood identity view so it could be a taller thing some people had mentioned signage or you know a larger element or a way that that could be kind of an iconic moment that you see when you come in from the street. So perhaps that could be a stairway or, or more glassy or taller. And then we have what we're calling the opaque program. So that's the bathrooms and kitchen, the more inward facing um, program. So right now, you know, the, the discussion point is, does it make sense to have that along Holden or does that want to go um, somewhere else in the building? And then on the north you have, um, it sounded like most folks were happy with the loading, staging, trash recycling area coming off of the alley, staging the events by the stage. And then another important thing would be to resolve the, the Northwest entry. So making that more accessible and spacious and you know, questioning, does, that, does the entry need to be there? Should the entry just be a singular entry on the West or the Southwest? And if we do have this ramp there, how to make the ramp um, more accessible, like going to a 5% ramp or grading in a way that's accessible yeah. to all people because um, so that would be a high priority. So then zooming in on the building itself. So this is a, a diagram of the floor plan. So um, again, the starting with the Southwest. So this could be kind of a a third place coffee cafe, like maybe there's doors and windows and, and like a, a low kind of you know, seating and, and ways that when you walk along Holden, you could kind of see in and, and have a, a intermediate space before you go into the building itself and the flex space. And that could be very open to the community. And then one thought was that the kitchen could become more central. So rather, so currently in the old building, the kitchen was in the, the corner. So when you had corner bar and things, I see Blair, Blair's thumbs up in there. <laughs> Probably were standing in line. Maybe Blair spent a lot of time, like we all did, in long lines there. So if the kitchen were more central, then you could bring in people um, from both directions and, and relieve some of the congestion in the corner. And then you would flip it so the of what it was previously and have the bathrooms, which would be all gender, um, single stall bathrooms in the south um, west corner. East. Southeast corner. And then perhaps there's a stair and, the, and then perhaps if we do an upper level or a basement, then that stair could perhaps be in the corner and, and be something that is visually an element coming in from, from the Southeast. Another theme that we heard from several comments was that it was nice having some division between the flex space. So having those, having that um, partitioning between the, the flex space one, off of the patio versus flex space two, which was larger, having 
um, an ability that both the spaces can be used together, but also could be somewhat partitioned and you could have a quiet zone or a more active zone or the ability to somehow uh, separate between the two. And then it sounded like most people were happy with the stage in the, on the north off of the loading and then just being more thoughtful about the storage. So it's easier to put tables and chairs and equipment in and out and having that um, kind of more thoughtfully accessible to the flex space and stage. So then the, the thought would be, you know, since we're rebuilding, you know, you could build a taller, a taller ceiling, you know, you can go up to a maximum of 35 feet in this zoning. So, you know, theoretically, you could have like a three story building, or a, a very tall two story um, building, or at least the minimum a high spacious ceiling. So in this um, proposal, or this thought, you would have a, a stair in the corner that would bring you up to a second level and you could have mezzanine seating, you could have a bridge access, storage, and you could build out um, future use, even if you there wasn't like the immediate need, or maybe if the if HPIC is not ready to have the um, need to service the additional space, you could have um, build stuff for a future phase that the community could grow into. So this could be open to below, and it would also have the opportunity for people to get more quiet zones. So sometimes when there's like an event or concert or something, and it's you know more loud by the stage, people could also um, kind of come up on the mezzanine and find quieter spaces. And if we did this too, we probably would need, um, well, I think I'm, we would need an elevator and we would need this to be accessible to everyone. So we would want to think about that as well. So those are the floor initial floor plan. So so then at the end we'll kind of be wanting to hear people's thoughts on a general arrangements so we can go back to those plans and um, hear feedback on arrangements. Uh, so then we were going to look at some massing studies. So um, again, we don't see this as a design proposal, but rather a spectrum of options. And I think this is probably one of the most exciting moments in the process where the community can kind of like chart our path together about like what is the level of ambition what is each pick um, want to be as a as a you know does it want to be like a more low-key does it want to be something that's more iconic does it want to be you know funky and more like an art center like what is you know what does the building want to say um, to the people who use it and also people who kind of see it driving by so we did a quick um, spectrum of possible shapes. So they're kind of generally arranged from um, more basic, like straightforward schemes with scheme one and two to more um, avant-garde radical schemes on scheme 12. So we're not proposing any particular scheme, but we just wanted to open up that, you know, there are many ways that the building could be rebuilt. So. So scheme one and scheme two would um, retain the west portion. So the gables, the twin the kind of twin gables would be retained. And then those could be extruded out. Um, or in scheme one, you could add like a kind of a barn shape to the, to the new addition. So these would retain the basic um, eave heights and ceilings, and then they would extrude themselves out. Um, to the to the new portion that will be rebuilt or in scheme three you could make a gable that went over the entire thing so it'd be sort of a large barn shape just um, could cover over the existing gables which is also sometimes called california framing if they were to just keep it and build right over the top and then scheme four would be like a large shed so you could you could shed the building from um, a low point on holden to a high point on the north, which would give you north light and and um, also a you know, large kind of, sort of south facing roof that would present itself to Holden. And scheme five um, would be a butterfly roof. So you could invert the uh, gable and collect the rainwater down the valley, bringing it to the courtyard. 
and you could have options of like a low and a high side. So you could have a, um, you know, the low side of the butterfly could be along Holden and the high side could be to the north, which would still present a south facing solar opportunity. You could do a diagonal butterfly, which would open up the corners, which would bring a tall corner to the Holden side and a less tall corner to the um, parking side. Or you could do it the other way. You could have the tall corner to the kind of coffee shop, cafe side, and the lower corner to the to the southeast. Is that a butterfly? That's a butterfly that going this way. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Or it's, 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 it's diagonaling down. Yeah. Or you could have a ramping. You could ramp. You could curve and ramp up, you know, which would have many recreational uses <laughs> that have certain roofing implications. And then this last line, these are a little bit more um, wacky, as Jody was calling them, um, or avant-garde. Um, and not that we're proposing any of these, of these per se specifically, but that you could do, you know, you could do a, like a more sculptural. I think it's to get folks to see that there's a lot of opportunity on that, especially on that Southeast corner. Right, the Southeast corner. And, and does the building want to be a more sculptural shape that that you know gets people's attention and it could be kind of a beacon and a place that people remember oh that's the building with you know the yeah. with the funny roof or with the yeah. with a thing like that it's a thing. <laughs> so so then looking at these um we kind of narrow down a few that to look at more specifically the what the pros and cons of the different some different roof shapes would be so we'll look at next um three of those more specifically So before we look at those three, um, you know, one of our main um, context framing points is that the building sits between these townhomes um, to the east and these townhomes to the west. And so, you know, something that that's happening in Highland Park is that you know, traditionally you know, Highland Park has been, you know, evolving over the decades. And I think until maybe 10 or 15 years ago was mostly identified by single family, small kind of craftsmen or, you know, the war boxes, you know, simple more worker housing. And then as the city of Seattle has densified and upzoned a lot of the arterials such as um, Holden Avenue Southwest, Highland Parkway, 16th, you know, as the main arterials have been upzoned, those buildings are now increasingly three or four story townhomes. So I think thinking ahead to the future, you know, 10, 20, 30 years in the future, it's very likely that you know, many of these buildings along Holden and along 9th and Highland Parkway will be three or four story, you know, very dense buildings. So thinking about what the building would look like um, as it relates to that um, urban fabric, urban context, and also the two buildings that it's sitting between. So, the you know the this was kind of a you know 2000s era townhome and this is a you know this townhome was built I think five years ago and so like what is the language of the building want to say as it relates to these townhomes and how does it right now it's a little bit kind of housey kind of has a house feel because that was the context of the neighborhood at the time and as it evolved but so is that still the language that's the right language is there something that should be adapted and updated for a for a public building, for a community building in the future. These are the kind of questions that we wanted to get feedback on. Okay, so we have three um, schemes we narrowed in on. So again, these are the 12. So this, these are the 12 to that point about how it looks in between the two buildings. You know, this is one of the most uh, prominent views coming in from uh, Highland Parkway heading west on Holden. So you'll have the townhome here, the townhome there, and then you'll see this um, this is kind of the public corner that you'll you'll see when you're driving by and then other corners. You also see the other corner, but that's the corner you'll more experience um, entering as a person. So you'll see that depending on the shape of the building, you get a quite different read on how it presents itself to the community, whether it's a more um, gable, more kind of quiet gable 
versus a more sculptural prow or a curving roof coming up like that or a more sculptural piece you know it's gonna it has a certain language that will say something and so what is that what does that language want to be so the first scheme is the scheme one which is keeping the west gables so this would keep the west two gables and then build one large um, kind of barn shape over the new part of it so so some of the pros which it would which are that retain the shape so there's kind of it seems like there's a range of opinions about that some of the people really like keeping those gables and they like that original form and the history of it and so you this scheme would keep the memory of that um, it would expand the solar exposure you could get more south facing exposure on the um, taller expansion you know, some of the cons could be that um, this was kind of a leaky area which would be not really resolved in the new one where you have these um, two, you know, a valley coming down and, and water kind of getting in there. So that was not ideal. You know, it could be more cost to retain the old and kind of adding a new building onto an old building and dealing with old foundations and new foundations and old systems and new, you know, it may or may not be um, a true cost savings to keep it or it may actually cost more to keep part of the old building, but we'll know more of that as we get into more detail. Um, and then some other concerns could be that it may be overshadowed by the townhomes because it still keeps a pretty low profile and maybe it lacks a certain civic scale. Um, the other schemes maybe have um, a more prominent size. So this is how it would look coming from Holden. So you'd be coming up at Holden and then the roof shape would kind of be similar to the other townhomes, but a larger, um, larger gable. You could have the signage in the corner and then glassy along Holden, and that could be the entrance off of the southwest. And then the west patio. Um, in all schemes, I think you would have a opportunity to build this deck and awning out, so having people and this indoor outdoor <clears> connection <throat> um, from the west patio, I think would be good in all schemes. So we're opening up doors, mm -hmm. opening up onto that outdoor space. Right, right. So even if we kept the, the original, if we kept this, still there would be a proposal to cut out a large opening and add doors to it and, and having awning and a connection back out to the, to the fire pit and the the seating and outdoor space. So there would still be, so, and that's, so then that's this question of if we're gonna be majorly remodeling and, and modifying what was there, would it be easier just to build that all from scratch? Okay, then the, another scheme we looked at in more detail was the scheme five, which was the butterfly roof. And so um, some of the pros, are that you could collect the water into the rain garden. So you could um, build upon the that beautiful rain garden that's there and um, bring more water to it. And that could kind of express a certain sustainable ethos around water capture. You know, it is a relatively simple roof form, you know, just two planes coming together. Um, you'd have even more uh, solar exposure. So you had an even larger wow. south facing um, exposure to get solar panels on. It's a little bit more of a, maybe a civic scale and shape. Maybe it says it's, it's more a more public building, more uh, community place rather than a more housey shape. Um, some of the, some of the cons, um, some of the cons are that, you know, it does divide it to uh, north south. So, you know, the roof would then have an impact on the interior layout. So we'd then look at the interior layout, what that means for the stage. And then if we do a mezzanine and the volume <laughs> and the layout would um, you know, be impacted by this two-sided nature. And then it says goodbye to the twin gables. So the twin gables would be, would be no more. This is how it would look from the, um, from Holden Street corner. So you'd have this corner coming up that maybe has the stair signage, you have the roof coming out this way, so it gives a taller um, facade to Holden Street. 
and then the taller south facing would go diving back from there. And then on the west patio, you still would have a open deck and doors coming in there. And then the water capture would come in here. So you'd be able to bring the water into the, to the rain garden directly from there. And then the last one was the more, um, we looked at a more wild scheme. So this was the diagonal butterfly. So this one would give the tallest presentation to the, the more public south uh, east and then the southwest would be the lower po point. So the water collection could come down like a prow and that would be kind of focused, you know, focusing the lines of the building would come down to the southeast corner, like the entry. Um, you still would get good expanded solar exposure yes. more um, to the west. Uh, not not as good as the other one, but you still get some. Um, you would get this more iconic and unique um, kind of civic scale um, as, a, <clears throat> as a more unique thing. So it could present itself as a more like a more building that people remember. Uh, then the cons, the downside is a more complex roof form. So it would probably be more expensive and uh, difficult to build. You would also have these constraints diagonally about dividing the space. So it would set up a certain kind of experience on the inside that had to do with these two more triangular shapes. Um, and then it also would say goodbye to the Queen Gables. <laughs> so this is how it would look from the corner. So you'd get this very tall corner. You could have this very iconic prow in, coming up. Does that relate to the height of the townhomes? Yeah, homes? it would be the same height. The same, oh. Yeah, so I think basically it'd be effectively the same height as the townhome, because the townhome is built out to the max. So effectively the peak of the townhome would match the peak of the of this guy. So then it would kind of stand up tall relative to those guys. Um, and then you could have a more, you know, a more expressive siding and lighting and be more kind of like a pavilion type of expression. And on the west patio, you'd get these kind of origami shaped folding planes. So you'd get this sculptural expression that you could keep, um, you could express with the awning. And, and maybe that would also be a way to um, grade some of the topography to get a more accessible entry. So you could have these kind of folded, almost like um, terrain topography mm -hmm. folded plates. So, so it has a little more of a like a contemporary little avant garde shape to it um, that would get attention and be, be something that's very different. Okay. So those are, and again, those are not, we're not proposing any specific design. These are just um, talking points around like the pros and cons of different directions that we could take. Although we're sure that people ha will have opinions, which is good. So, so then the next part, um, we put together some images of buildings, uh, there are community buildings and public buildings that had a positive feeling from some of um, the people in the survey or some of the people on, on the HPIC team and the, our design team. So some of these are around Seattle. So the Duwamish Longhouse stood out as a, as a very unique building with a you know, very uh, particular expression with that rough human siding, you know, the signage, you know, the, the, the logo. Um, it just really feels like both inside and outside, it has a really um, true expression of, of what the building is speaking to and who it's for and, and what's happening in there. And then this is the intellectual house um, at UW with a really nice um, articulated wood interior. This was the Montlake, uh, Seattle Public Library, Montlake branch, which has a, a really nice porch kind of community expression on the outside and on the inside has a really comfortable um, and very well detailed, very thoughtfully articulated um, framing and windows and um, articulation is very comfortable sp space. This is the High Point um, Community Center. What can they call it? The neighborhood house, the high point.
these were others, some around Seattle or beyond. Um, this is the Ballard Library, which also has a very uh, articulated interior with expressed columns, framing, this mix of materials. You know, it tries to kind of break down the pieces into smaller um, individual members. So when you're in the building, you kind of feel like you're um, more homey. I think that's some of some of this feeling that you feel people feel like they're comfortable have to do with elements of the building that are smaller and broken down. Um, so you can kind of find your place in it. Like person scale. Right, person scale. So like a human body could have different pieces around it and you, you feel like you're a little more comfortable. So like bars, like beer star or bars often have that, you know, they've got different heights and levels and places and ins and outs where you can you know, feel like you can gather in different size groups and be comfortable. This was the Icicle Creek um, Art Center that has a nice expression that way. This is the inside of that building um, that had, again, this articulated interior. And then this is the O space um, on Vashon, which is a little more industrial, kind of industrial art thing. This one? Uh, that's Camp Long. So Camp Long mm -hmm. also has kind of a kind of like that really wonderful, like old Seattle, like warm, lodgy feel nestled in its site. And this is uh, the Sands End Arts and Community Center. Um, this also we felt had a nice, um, a lot of nice things happening. Uh, it has a courtyard in the center, so it has a, a street facing facade and then the inside it has a courtyard um, on the low side. So the roof um, slopes up from the courtyard side, which is more scaled to the, to the human body and the person. And then on the high side, it's more um, expressing itself to the street with tall, higher windows. And then on the interior, it has a nice kind of rough hewn, woody expression that felt both, um, you know, felt both civic and, and artsy, but also um, friendly, not overly, not overly refined. So you felt like you could be comfortable in there and doing stuff and, and feel good. And lastly, just some roof shapes and materials. So these are looking at different flat roof, peaks, gables, skylights, you know, offset gables, the roof um, and the materiality are probably the main opportunities for the building to have a certain expression. So those are all the, the exhibits, the design and, and drawing exhibits we have. So the last thing, just ending, ending um, it before we open it up to all of you and, and everybody's feedback, um, what we're hoping to get out of the meeting is um, feedback from the community about this spectrum of ambition, we're calling it, from um, that has to do both with um, what the building will be and how it will function but it also has to do with cost and um, time. So there's kind of a range of thoughts from on the one, um, you know, on the one end, like let's just get this thing up and running as quickly as possible. We, you know, whatever will get us there quickest. On the one end, versus like let's really um, shoot for the moon and like aim as high as we can, and you know, fundraise and build the best possible building um, and shoot high mm -hmm. long, -term. long term. So feedback on that. Uh, we're also curious about reaction to those precedents so we can go back and people can, um, we're hoping people can ask and share their thoughts on some of those individual buildings, um, thoughts on civic expression, neighborhood identity, what is, um, and Kay could speak to this as well, like what is, really, you know, kind of like how the Duwamish along has felt right for that community in that place, like what feels right for Highland Park and this community. And then sustainability goals, so what are, what, what are we trying to aim for in terms of sustainability, um, energy, water capture, sustainable materials? And then um, finally, you know, just what will happen next is we'll take this feedback and then we'll put together um, a more specific design. And the next time we meet, we'll actually have a more um, specific proposal to get feedback on. So that concludes our portion. Thank you, um, or at least our formal portion. So, um, Kay, I, I could leave the slides up, and we could go back to them, or I could stop sharing for a moment and talk. Any any thoughts? Um, do is there a consensus? Do people 
um, we might want to have conversation or pull the slides. I don't, I don't know. Do people want to make comments on a specific image while we're doing this, um, or do you all want to um, kind of get, kind of go to the conversation? We can go back. We have a lot of comments and questions in our chat boxes too, to to refer back to and try to capture as well. Um, um, so. Um, yeah, and I think uh, I think that I had also made a note of initially, which is kind of like how what people think uh, about us as our, our neighborhood, the neighborhood that we live in, what's important to us, and uh, what what we want this building to say. And then I also want to um, acknowledge all the um, incredibly important concerns about cost. And, and technical and practical considerations, which, which are all kind of really important and valid. And I just want to let you know, the board is also really concerned about this issue too. And we're actually gonna have a meeting. We have a scheduled meeting next week with a professional fundraiser to ask questions about what is involved in that kind of process. So we can better kind of help uh, the community weigh our, um, you know, sort of our strengths and our, um, you know, if we're going to be able to pursue that kind of thing, or if we need to really um, stay in a modest place. So uh, I just wanted y'all to know that going into this. So it's not cut in stone either way. Um, yeah, so um, does anybody want to start? Any hands raised? Or should I just go into a chat and start going down the questions? What do you think, Matt? Barry, you have something? Yeah, the um, I think I'm unmuted. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, the thing that really struck me in your presentation that I remembered, and that I think is really at the heart of HPIC, is the mezzanine around the uh, around the performance space. That really gives a scale to the performance space. It's put puts us, you know, makes it central. And it is creates a really good vibe for anything from a band playing to a quinceanera to a yeah. wedding to the types of life events that uh, each pick, uh, you know, contains. And um, if uh, anybody's ever been there, it reminds me of Tipitina's in New Orleans. They have an old style dance floor with a mezzanine around it. That's really magical. And to me also, I really appreciate the, the shapings. And that's really interesting and unique. But, you know, the key to uh, HPIC is what's inside, just like the neighborhood. And so I really think, I think Blair had a comment that the acoustics or what happens inside should really drive the design. That's my two cents. Thank you, Barry. Uh, Music lovers, unite. Yeah, I really think that the acoustics of the performance space should be perhaps the central element that uh, informs the overall shape of the building. And as a, a secondary influence on the overall shape of the building, I like the idea of the upstairs area over what is now the bathrooms and kitchen of that second floor area there being something that could expand out over where the dining area is right now. And that again would also inform the overall shape of the building, although that might be a later phase that takes those two gables and does something else with that shape over that part of the building. But I, I'd really like to see uh, function uh, be front and center and that it the overall shape does something magical to wrap around that function. Hmm. Uh, I think Monica has her hand up. Hi, uh, just a comment. I'm, I'm really kind of blown away by all these designs. Thanks, Matt. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, we've suffered such loss by this violent act. And um, part of me wants to 
you know, my memory wants the old building back, but when I see these dynamic shapes and these modern sculptural pieces, I'm like, wow, those are exciting and the dynamic. And is that what we need? I think that's one question besides the functionality, which is, I think, a great idea, Blair, um, is the, the visual presentation. You know, do we want to have elements of the old building, like in the first two um, images you had, or do we want to go dynamic and blow out the neighborhood with something really wild. I mean, I think that's something that we need to think about. Um, also, I have another question going along those lines. Uh, if if we redes when we redesign the whole building, is it is it more, uh, you know, is it better financially to keep the plumbing on that south side of the building as opposed to move it into another another area of the building? Yeah, I'm, we're not sure. It's, that's a great question. I think we could we should note that, flag that, and usually usually a function of the of the sewer line. Yeah, is the is the main one, and then also where the electrical service is. So we should yeah we should look at that. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's exactly Monica's question. Is I think what we're looking for feedback on is like where to go in that spectrum of like, you know, for fundraising. I mean, I. I I totally agree that the you know form follows function. So the function of the interior and what the space is used for should express itself. And then how does that expression and, and what expression has an effect you know, towards fundraising and just getting people excited and having people feel like, yes, let's really put money towards this and let's make this thing happen. I'm, I have a question. And I think a few people had questions about um, would we consider uh, adding another level? Like Case said, we can go up to 35 feet. And I'm just curious how that might uh, transform the, the use of that space. Yes, I think one of the issues is, is parking. I think, you know, if we expand the square footage, we have to look at what that means for parking. That's something Dakota was also noting that. Um, we want to, so that's just what we have to look at. You know, technically you could do three, you could have a three-story building there. You could have three floors and then we would have to study what that would mean for, um, I mean, there could be workarounds, but it, could, it is just something to navigate. Could be requirements. Requirements from the city. The city would require, tends to require certain parking things. So it's, it's just something we'd have to be looked at. So I think it's both a cost question, you know, how big, how much of a building do you want to build? You know, the more stories, the more floors, the more it's going to cost, and then also, um, you know, what does that mean for the permitting and things like that? So I think that's kind of what we're you know, we're looking at. Like, what's the you want to reach high, you know, reach for the maximum thing we can do that's that's doable within our fundraising capability. Yeah, and also that's sustainable for us financially as a neighborhood so that we can hold the property going into the future and not risk losing it um, to financial pressure. Um, and also we have a hand raised, Erica. Hey, thanks. I have a couple questions. So one regarding, I guess not so much a question, but <laughs> sort of directed at the functionality of the building. Um, I moved here about four years ago and I was blown away because there's so few spaces that do have live music and having one close by was such a big deal. And so um, we're losing those spaces all over Seattle. And the fact that we have one here is uh, quite paramount, especially that in West Seattle, there's almost none. And so I, not just in terms of the functionality of this being in a performance space, but also in terms of fundraising, I think it would be really important to reach out to our music community and hear from them what would help them to sell this space to their audiences. Because we're not just gonna get an audience from here, we're gonna get it from all over, especially West Seattle. And sort of what would be a space that they would want to play in um, will help us to fundraise. And then my other question was, obviously Holden is in a very particular predicament right now because of the West, Seattle Bridge closure. Um, but I don't know that it will ever go back to being as quiet as it once was. I think we're always going to have a little bit more traffic than we're used to. And so 
Um, if there's any way that I, I, without losing parking, we can think about um, more of a barrier from that roadway for that space, because it is so much more comfortable on the north side of the building with the sort of extremity of the traffic now. Um, so I almost feel like we have to kind of think about reorienting ourselves to protect us from the traffic on Holden going forward. So just the thought in terms of um, some of the massing and, and the light that would hit those open spaces. Yeah, yeah and the sound, the noise and you know, all the car, you know, the smells and sounds and all that. Yeah. A good point because they're going to be putting, um, they're going to move, um, they're going to remove that walkway on 11th and they're going to put in a, SDOT's going to put in a four, I think a four way or just, or it's a, a light at 12th and Holden right there at the corner. True. So that's going to kind of change the traffic, the pedestrian traffic, et cetera. That'll be on 12th. At 12th oh, and Holton. Yeah. 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 So that corner will be different. That'll be a lot of people coming in from that corner. So that may open the question right. of some reworking of the access point. Yeah. Into the into the west patio. Yeah. Uh, next we have Dakota. I just wanted to uh, have a chance to say before that part of the conversation slipped that I also think it, that we have to balance the um, walkability of that street and our, our neighborhood is so unwalkable in so many ways with um, you know closed elevations like the one that is on Holden and so I think Erica <laughs> Erica and I used to work together so we're <laughs> like the healthy debate um, over uh, urban planning issues <laughs> but I think um, it is more comfortable and um, on the north side but that we also need to think about a little bit of modulation along that side not just on the two corners but that we always want to be contributing to those walkable streets which, meet, which means a little bit of transparency a little bit of mm -hmm. um, variation or modulation in the building um, since we are so close to that to that street edge. Can I ask a clarifying question, Dakota, because I'm not an architect. Uh, do you mean that um, just the way that the building appears on that side of Holden, that you're saying don't make it look like yeah. such a hard hardscape? Are yeah, you saying it's called, mm -hmm. it's called a blank wall. And that's what we have right now, at least, you know, because we have the doors, oh, have the, you know, the doors are always closed. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to have all windows on that side or um, you know, I'm not saying necessarily move the kitchen. I think it's actually placed in a really smart location. And then the bathrooms require a closed elevation, of course, but um, there are still architectural interventions that can be done, whether it's clear story windows that, you know, start to, to stack the, the massing of the building back um, and just give the sense of a little less regularity along that side. And I think we're already starting to see that on that iconic corner um, in this view, and then, um, you know, entrance on the other side. But I just, I just want to um, think about the fact that a lot of people are arriving by foot. Um, and that this is, I think, as illustrated by that context map, this is what folks are seeing about, the, so many people are seeing this. And it's a, it's, it's a, you know, it's almost a gateway to our neighborhood. So making sure that that elevation that faces Holden has, um, is that really, you know, what do we, what's the message we want to telegraph about who we are and who we want to be? Inclusivity, um, welcoming, community, fill in the blanks. And I put that in the chat too. You know, what are the, what are the things that we want to express with this space, with this project, not just the building? And I put that in the chat too, that I hope we can think of this as a project, not just the building, since we've learned so much about what it means to be able to have um, celebrations outside, especially in pandemic times where that creates more healthy options for everyone. Um, but it's, it's, you know, that transformed HPIC when it, it transformed the experience. And so um, this is another iteration on that journey of, of the transformation of HPIC and what do we want to say about who we are. And to me, it, that walkability piece and that um, importance on that side. Is, is paramount. 
A, a lot of people have brought up in the chat though, of course, um, there's some conflicting um, I mean, you have to sort of manage light if you're going to have performance space and how that can be done um, will we'll have to be also in, kind of included in, in the way it's thinking because you you have light and then you also have solar gain. You have that that's a very hot side of the building. It turns into a little oven over there in the, in the summertime um, on that south side. It's very, very, very hot. So, um, you know, I you know we're just just saying anyway also because some other people brought that up too in the chat um was adding windows is, is adding light which has to be managed somehow if no one has their hand up i i, I don't know if it's like i like i think in some of the um schemes the kind of the a tall corner i like a tall corner at the 11th and Holden um, intersection. And so it looks like there's a few options that have a tall corner. Um, I think the, the second story functionality, I think is important. And so some of these, I think about, you know, the stewardship that we have in making these decisions and have something that's really going to provide a lot of functionality for a lot of different people over a long period of time, over hopefully generations. And, um, you know, would hate to have, have my grandchildren <laughs> be like, why did they do that? Like, why there's not all, like, where's the usable space? You know, so I think that's definitely on my mind. And I think, you know, looking at the survey results, people want this to be, a, like, I think there's a lot of energy around a performance space, but also around a learning and education space. And I think that second story provides potentially you know, space for two classrooms that could be used for um, anything from, you know, like exercise classes or meditation classes or, you know, a community book group or, you know, I just think that, you know, having some more intimate spaces on the second story um, can help us fulfill some of the call for a space that um, we learn in as well as a place we enjoy performances. Um, so I would want the roof and, you know, to to not definitely not preclude the use of that second story. Yeah. yeah. I'm just going to go for it. <laughs> um, this might be a personal design uh, intention, but um, some of the precedents that you showed that were much more sort of naturalistic in their material choices. I, I know it's also in vogue right now, but uh, we have an incredibly, I mean, you all know, we have such a beautiful natural environment here and there's amazing gardens. We have incredible parks. We have a lot of greenery. And I think um, this is an opportunity for us to celebrate that within the form of this building as well. So I really loved the precedents that you pulled that included like the greens and the warm, natural colors and even in the um blank facade that uh, we're dealing with you know that art as dakota was saying that articulation and that use of natural materials um if we do have to have blank facade i think um that blend of the new and the old is a little bit of what i don't know in my mind we're trying to do here a bit that we're trying to give homage to history but recognize that we can kind of grow and do something more in this space. So I, I did really love the the precedents that you used that had more of those natural features in them. And maybe within that there is an opportunity for fundraising or you know the some of the the different material suppliers like you know glue lamp suppliers or wood suppliers or bricks. You know it does this it is the kind of community project where you could get um, maybe some community support for some of those materials like sponsorship or, or, um, you know, donations or fundraising could be around that. So I think that the materials could be something that um, could be variable and opportunities around, you know, getting um, sustainably sourced materials, you know, the story of the materials, you know, there's certainly a huge environmental um, impact that, um, certain materials have, you know, for, for carbon, their carbon 
footprint um, and sustainability aspects are also really large in addition to how they're how they're expressed and felt so that i think that's going to be an important part of um, and i think people get excited about materials too if you have um, these warm natural materials and details and you do the renderings you know that gets people really excited for the fundraising too We have some comments in chat about noise to the sound, just the sound about of the that we ourselves as users or folks using our facility make, you know, making sure that those are um, well considered, particularly being a good steward in a neighborhood context. And and I also want to comment that um, I think it was Emily right that was talking about the noise of Holden, and it is a really prevailing. Um, it's like a river running through the neighborhood, this rushing, horrible sound. And even uh, before uh, the, the bypass traffic, it was a horrible, loud sound. And I have to say that as a resident of a, that lives uh, just a half a block off Holden, I really appreciate the really tall, huge apartment buildings right behind me that block me from that sound. And so uh, in one sense is the club could actually provide a benefit and a buffer that would protect some of the residential area from having to absorb the impact of that noise. And then of course, remaining a good neighbor um, ourselves sonically is pretty important to, to, to me. Yeah. I'm kind of looking through the chat, but this is a great opportunity for anybody else. Now we've got the, the plot, we've got the drawings up, so you don't even have to speak in front of anybody because no one can see your face. So just go for it. <laughs> if you would like to make a comment, please feel free. Um, I know we talked, you talked about the professional fundraising that's happening, but again, I just was, is there a way to know, I mean, is, are these uh, ideas that we're seeing tonight, are they in the range of what we can do or is there, fundraising that's going to have to happen before we even start or I mean we have talked about you know sort of adding along over the years just kind of getting us a you know a space a shell a, you know and then building on but I'm just wondering what these represent in terms of our current um, reimbursement from insurance or whatever money that we had to get going. Yeah, I don't, I don't, it's a great question. <laughs> That's what we told Kate and Julie that they would. <laughs> they're modest. They're modest but. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think. That's something that we, that the design team kind of needs feedback on sooner rather than later about how, you know, that those key questions, are we just doing a shell and feeling, you know, some of leaving some of it to finish over time or you know, like how, how much funds do we have to work with here? Was there a, um, was there, a, I thought we had kind of a general, I sort of felt, and it's probably because it's what I want, but um, I sort of felt like last time we said, hey, let's just get what we can sooner the better. And then we can, you know, project new things coming in the future as money comes along. I thought that that was sort of the, that's what I thought we left with, but mm. I'm, uh, and how's that going to get decided? That's all. I think this is Shannon. Um, I from I'm the treasurer for HPIC. Um, so we are going to meet with that professional fundraiser on Monday and learn from them just kind of what that what a big kind of capital project fundraising effort looks like. Um, as far as I know, none of these designs have really been costed out, so we don't know. Like right now, we're just kind of. I think still providing input to um, Whitman Estes to, you know, kind of get designs a little bit more formalized that can be costed out. And then we can, and we know how much we're getting from um, our insurance, um, which is about 750,000. And then, um, and then, yeah, we'll find out what we need to do for that capital campaign and see kind of what feels like it's in the realm of what we can raise. And I think um, like Erica mentioned, you know, having a performance space, I think is incredibly valuable um, for the community as well as 
um, to those who are interested in, in performing arts. So, um, you know, looking at you know, just the ways that we need to pitch HPIC um, to people who may be willing to give tens of thousands of dollars, um, larger sums of money than maybe any of uh, us individuals in the neighborhood can give. Uh, I think, you know, we're looking at uh, what is the personality, what is the function of, of the club on behalf of the neighborhood, and then um, I, I'm personally very opposed to us contorting ourselves to just get funders, but I think also looking at, you know, what kind of a compelling space this is that would attract funders who want to um, allow this building to continue to be community held um, for future generations. So, um, sorry, a little bit a smattered in terms of my thinking, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, we have a lot more to figure out. Um, I'll use this as an opportunity quickly to say that we are, as part of this process, um, and I think we've alluded to it before, we're working with 501 Commons to do some more strategic development um, and really get into that. What is the function of HPIC as an organization? And you know what, what will this building be serving? Um, and what programming will we be offering to the community in the future? So um, we, have, we have a lot of things that we're trying to get done in this first quarter of 2022 to answer some of these fundamental questions, to answer some of the financial questions as well as um, the function questions. So uh, <laughs> a, lot, a, lot, a lot happening that would inform um, a response to your question, Donna. I think that was Donna who was asking that. And we have a couple more questions too. I'm gonna call on Matt next and then Monica will be after that. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, so um, based on the current square footage of the footprint of the building and um, $750,000 in insurance claim, that's about $200 per square foot for a single story. Um, that's not a huge budget, even just to rebuild one floor. So, um, and that would be a pretty straightforward kind of structure. Um, so that's just one observation um, since I'm in the field. Um, and then the other thing I would urge um, for upkeep, um, uh, having a really high wall on the south side, um, especially the southwest corner, is the really a lot of of weathering and the use of materials is another question. Um, certainly wouldn't want to return to the vinyl siding that was there, um, but- uh, Oh, come on, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it, it it's vintage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, classic stuff. Um, but just uh, for upkeep, um, and maintenance, I would really urge, um, you know, uh, materials are always a, a tricky thing with design and um, and the shape of the roof obviously has lots of considerations with solar, um, light, uh, appearance, you know, but making sure that uh, material is chosen that is relatively easy to maintain um, let's talk about the Duwamish Longhouse. I, I love that live edge wood siding, um, but it does take a lot of maintenance to keep it uh, in good shape. So um, um, definitely having um, a, a roof structure that's functional, that's going to lead to an interior layout that makes sense. Um, you know, basically, when I think about walking into the to the building as it was, I can't imagine putting more things into that building in that footprint. Um, so if, if there's talk about adding functions, then I, I can't see any way of doing that without either going up or down, whether it's a a functional basement or a second story with a mezzanine or something along that line, but that's certainly gonna 
add a lot to budget, um, but just just a few observations. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. I really appreciate all, you're so practical. We really, really, really appreciate that. And we know how much physical work you've put into the property as it exists now. So the community owes you a tremendous amount of gratitude and also just honoring your experience and listening to this process. It's really, really, really helpful. I just want to emphasize that. Thank you. Yeah, thank uh, Monica, you. Yeah, you bet. Monica, go ahead. Hi, right, just a few things. Um, I don't know if people have really taken some time and looked at the Greenbridge library design, but I tell you, I love that place. And I don't know if anybody's been in the Greenbridge mm -hmm. library, but it is, it, and I'm just looking at photos of it here. It's a cool, simple, modern kind of look. Um, and that's all I wanted to say about that. But I also like the idea of the whole music venue bouncing off of Blair and um, what was the other woman's name, Sarah? Um, idea for, you know, putting the word out. I mean, there's these fabulous radio stations around here. I mean, maybe they could somehow teach radio, whatever it is, they could have a broadcast from Island Park live, you know, KBCS or KEXP. I mean, there's such a desire for that. And there's just metal. Hmm? You know. Um, yeah, where does yeah, where does John Richards live? He lives in West Seattle, right? He's in West Seattle. I mean, this is this is like Do we know where he lives? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I saw him at Trader Joe's once with his kid. Uh, you, gotta, anyway. you gotta hunt him down. <laughs> he lives like I he lives like all the way down 35th. I can pinpoint his house for you guys. And, and he's not he's not the only one. He's not the only John in the morning lives in Arbor Heights. Wow. Also, also you some, streaming channel H P I C. Yeah, well, <laughs> there you go. two yeah. thirds, two thirds of the uh, the executives at Sub Pop also live over here. Wow. Okay. Well, we call it uh, neighbors, not strangers. You know, whatever. But uh, I really think that there's a lot of potential mm -hmm. here, and I think music is really a good one. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Yeah, there's a lot of music money in West Seattle. A lot of, um, yeah, people who cannot be named, but we all know their music are <laughs> hunkered down in various spots in West Seattle, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We should name them. <laughs> That'll be a part of our fundraising <laughs> campaign. <Isn't that> <laughs> out them. We'll be outed. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, Monica, you're onto something and I just, I, I would like to say it's kind of like goes back to Matt's comments too, but and something that I know that the board has discussed and some of the other people in the community have discussed is it's kind of like an old fashioned barn raising. So what can, you know, there might be a way to think about like as we do this construction, because Matt, you're right, it's like cost of construction per square foot is way uh -huh. more. And so I'm thinking if there are ways to identify parts of the project that can be done by the community's hands and kind services, you know, donations, you know, et cetera, um, I think that is a way that the community could also engage in the production of the building, the construction of the building. So something, and I, I know that that's been brought up, but I just wanted to bring it up again because I don't want people to walk away from this thinking we just can't afford it because that's not gonna happen. We're gonna make this happen. Oh, sorry, I was typing. Uh, so, um, uh, I guess um, anybody else got their hand up right now? I'm just writing you a side message, Kathy, to answer your question. I'll, I'm going to come back to you in a second. Um, anybody else that hasn't had a chance to speak up? Sean, did you want to voice your question or anything? No, I mean, I think I feel like Matt actually did a uh, good job asking the same thing that I did. Um, or, you know, asking the same thing about the long term maintenance and the, the different shapes of the roof. And then also, um, although it's paramount to have accessibility and um, and make sure that everyone has um, equal use of the club. An elevator is kind of a game changer from a long-term maintenance thing to consider um, and what the implications are if, if 
if we lose power or if someone gets stuck and how do we have someone on contract and all of those things just an elevator is, is a game changer but it is obviously extremely important and number one that everyone has accessibility i'm just looking at the long-term maintenance stuff i agree totally Hi, Kate. This is uh, Bill Jayback. Oh, Bill, thanks for joining in. Uh huh. Yeah, both Cheryl and I have been listening in. Um, we had a question. Uh, we've been absorbing and just kind of taking in everything that's been presented. And I'm really, really enthusiastic about our opportunities here for, for the club, for the space. Um, so I'm very optimistic, personally, um, for the direction we're going to go. My question, our question for Sh from Cheryl and I is um, how, how do we remain involved in the, the dialogue about these next steps as the process becomes more granular um, as um, specific design points, fundraising points, all of those points come up. Um, you know, what, what's the dialogue going to look like outside of the town hall context um, as we move into the next step of the planning? What a super lead in, Bill. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay I you try. later. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, before we go there, uh, Monica, did you have your hand up still or are you, um, are you done? Yeah, go for it. You're muted though. I want to say one thing. Landscaping. I must say, Kay and I, we get out there and we bust our asses. We have a new rule though. We only will fill up the clean green container and no more at this point. So I am rallying for volunteers. And if anybody wants to chop, rake, sweep, dig, prune, we'd love to help. I mean, love you to help. So. And it's really fun too. I mean, I love working with Kay. We have so much fun and it's just another thing that people can do to kind of stay connected to the club while it's an eyesore. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a really good lead in because I think there was also a lot of other direct questions or comments in our survey that had more to do with operational questions like that, like volunteer opportunities, which um, we are really, really hard uh, badly pressed to manage we don't really even know how to do that you know we're just so small and we're so volunteer um, but just know that we're really grappling with those issues um, so if you have ideas and you want to bring them forward I encourage you to do that um, and then um, another uh, I took a another question from another uh, person online here off this discussion but we will be having an HPAC meeting next week too so where we'll be able to have more time to talk about general neighborhood concerns and I don't think we have too many um, presentations at that meeting. So uh, hopefully we'll have some time for community discussion and, and concern about uh, just stuff going on in the neighborhood, things you wanna um, sort of brainstorm with your re fellow residents about. So feel free um, to get back to me about that. Um, and um, uh, the other thing I wanted to say then tonight is, so what are the next steps, right? So what Bill was saying. Um, so. Uh, at a certain point, uh, we, we uh, what's the term, fish are cut bait, right? Isn't that the right term? Um, so we, we are gonna, we are, um, what, what's the word? We're committed to public input, but we are not committed to public input at a super granular level is my thinking at this point, right? We will have to delegate some of that. We will have a person who's like the point person to communicate about stuff on the project, a project manager, so to speak. Um, so everybody will have a way to communicate about stuff, but I don't want us to get so dug, dug into the weeds that we're all talking about the paint colors for every room is my, is what I, where I'm going with that, right? Cause I can't even get my husband to agree about the paint colors that I wanna use in my house. So um, I'm not sure if that is where you're going with that bill, but, um, do you feel like you have more to say than you're getting a chance to say, or what? Where? What did you mean exactly? I, I think, Kay, I was thinking more in terms of um, 
Not, not so much the paint color. <laughs> Yay. Anything. Or, or the roof materials and the siding materials. Because I really do think at a certain level, you have to rely on uh, the, the paint professionals in the core group who are really putting in the time to um, make those decisions. I, I was thinking in terms of granular, in terms of uh, uh, more in terms of um, uh, sort of the, the use of the space, um, and how, um, how the space is gonna be projected. Um, I do love the idea of focusing on the musical component. And I think there are some real opportunities there to, to, um, to really capitalize on it, frankly, <laughs> in a literal sense, um, to, to raise funds. Um, but it's more, I, I think there are, there are, facets of usage of the space that really should be thought through and how the space can really be e economically utilized or redeveloped um, to, um, to fulfill those objectives. I, I love the idea of a visual presentation for the space, but it, you know, HPIC, you know, the, the club itself has never really been a beautiful space. Um, physically on the outside, but it's been a beautiful space on the inside. And I, I guess I'd kind of like to kind of keep that spirit, if that makes sense. Cheryl, did you have anything to add? I just wanted to say that a lot of stuff was presented today. And so you kind of need to just sit back and think about it. And so a lot of people are having pretty quick reactions, but there's probably going to be a lot of stuff simmering. So how do we get any thoughts that we have after this meeting to someone, really that's it. Matt, do you want that kind of question to come to you directly or through um, through HPIC? I mean, one thing you could do is, you know, some like the city has like public process where there's a kind of comment period. So, you know, like um, there could be comment periods about certain things like right now everything's on the table i think you know the you know there's kind of a graph of like opportunity like is wide open right now and then as we move forward with the process the opportunities will narrow as the decision funnel goes to where you know we'll, we'll want to just let the builders build the building mm -hmm. as drawn so so i think it's a question of for Kay and the community about you know how long what's the right time period to receive comments to let these things simmer and get the right um, target and still allow our design team to narrow, start narrowing things moving forward. So, so I don't know, I mean, you could work backwards from a schedule. I know when we first began talking, there was this thought of, you know, submitting a permit later this year and, and you know, going into construction like spring of, of 2023. So I think having that fundraiser and project manager on board to maybe create a, a, a more broad schedule about, you know, keep thing, we wanna keep the momentum. Um, you know, it is a long process to design and construct, you know, it's years. So we wanna figure out <clears throat> what's a realistic time frame and what increment in that time frame from now to the next step, do we have things open? So I don't know, I mean, what is a reasonable time? Maybe, I mean, we're kind of on this one month cycle with these HVIC meetings, so, um, I, I mean, we don't really have an answer to the question, but I think it's more about um, maybe Kay and the, the yeah, we're happy. you should put some broad like time frames on these and then and then divide that up into easy increments mm -hmm. in which there is yeah. you're open to feedback. So I can't do that right tonight. Um, I got we got to yeah. think about it and just strategize a little bit about that, but then we'll just let everybody know. Um, I also want to say um, to everybody, so a lot of uh, what you just brought up, Bill, too, is not necessarily related to the actual architecture. It's, it's about the club and the identity of the club. And I think that um, that's going to call for um, general membership meetings to resume, um, which have been sort of a hiatus kind of thing. We used to, in the old, really old days for folks who've been around for a long time, that was uh, every uh, second Wednesday, you just show up at the club and you'd have this long table and people would all sit down and one of the president would pound the gavel and you would be um, adjourned into a general meeting. And I think that 
the success of this Zoom platform for this kind of meeting is that you know you can do that with your pajamas on. You can do it. You don't have to leave the kids. You don't have to get a sitter. You can just like you can just be at that meeting. And I think that part of the process for the club itself going forward to answer that kind of program programmatic question like who are we? What is that? The little secret that we hold inside, you know, that we treasure so much. Um, we need to take that up, and it's not necessarily a way to put onto the architecture. Um, although it can inform the architecture up to a certain point, but it's also something to put on our own organization that we have to do stuff um, and get on that stuff. Yeah, and I, that's how I take that to heart is I think like we just need more broader uh, uh, HPIC community conversation. We don't get to meet at Corner Bar right now. And so, or we don't get to meet at an event or whatever. So we have to be more social in the ways that we can be. Hey, that, Matt, Matt Hooks made a really good uh, suggestion. He said, is there a way that we should like, like communicate to people on the fence or I don't know where, kind of like what's going on with the project? Um, and I think it's a good question. And it leads to like, you know, we all say, oh my gosh, this fencing is like, ugh. And there, I know there's been some discussion around how much we love the Girl Scouts art. And I think there's been a further discussion just, you know, positing maybe the fence can turn into an art project of some sort with the community and help the community get engaged um, so that we can see that there's progress being made while, you know, well, it's going to take some time, right, to maybe do some of these things, but at least there could be some engagement with the community in that regard and also communicate what's going on with the project. It's a thought. I like yeah, where Matt was going with that. Super. Um, All right. We also got a question in the, oh, Kim just posted it to everyone. Um, is there an opportunity to kind of get involved in subcommittees? And so I'll use this as a lead in to um, some of our non-architectural next steps. Um, so we are going to be meeting on January 27th with our uh, strategic planning consultants um, to do kind of a board assessment and start lo looking at that. And then from there, developing kind of the, the work streams and potential subcommittees that people can plug into. Um, and then I love Kay's comment about the general membership meetings. And so um, I'm gonna be taking that as kind of part of this uh, strategic planning work to maybe set start setting the uh, agenda to have some general membership meetings where we can have um, bigger conversations with a wider with a good a wide group of people um, of our members, uh, so that we can start making those decisions about who we are as an organization now in 2022, um, and and developing a strategic and kind of operational plans for what we want to offer to the community. Um, we're still working on ways of finding ways to gather and cultivate that sense of community um, as a board. So that might be one of the work streams that we have that people could get involved in. Um, I'm grateful for Monica mentioning the uh, gardening and you know the opportunity for volunteers there. Um, one of the things that I've learned in my time volunteering at HBIC is that things actually run, I, I always say it runs really magically. And what I've figured out is that it's, if somebody has an idea and they wanna see it happen, then the board empowers people to make things happen. Um, and so as if you have ideas of things that you want to see HPIC offer to the community and you have the capacity oh, to yeah. take a lead in um, making that offering um, especially in this time when we don't have the physical presence, we would also welcome volunteers who want to take the lead in, in making a community offering of, of any sort. Um, so we will be in communication about the next steps and the various ways that people can get involved in our different work streams. And then also um, look at resetting a schedule for uh, membership meetings as well. So that's, yeah, those are my next steps. Okay, and um, I think that was kind of like your concluding remarks, right, Shannon? 
Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, kept, I, I mean, yes, I, I, I just, no, no. just the, the stewardship of this building. I just, I like it. every time looking at these designs, it's just, it's inspiring. I think everyone has commented that it's exciting. It's an exciting time. Um, but it's also a big responsibility. And I just appreciate being part of this thoughtful community that is grappling with, um, this, you know, how we can best use this asset for, uh, mutual benefit. So I'm grateful for everyone who came. That's and my concluding comment. <laughs> okay, super. Thanks, Shannon. And I do see a hand raised, uh, Barry. Is that you? Yeah. Um, just one last comment or for me that a suggestion, I guess, really, as a lot of people have talked about, there's a nexus between building function and fundraising. And I think when you're talking to your professionals, you know, we've talked a lot about music. That can take everything from the point of view of, you know, performance to streaming to music education. There's a lot of things there. And how do you connect with the people who have money to give and see what they're interested in within that arena? And if you can find agreement there, uh, that could be pretty powerful as far as our fundraising goes. I'm taking a note. Yes, but I think that has a lot of legs. We haven't talked about the kitchen, but that too, I think has a lot of legs, a lot of potential uses that would benefit the community that people would give money to, you know, in the West Seattle, Seattle area. Yeah, and in terms of our, our timeline now, we're not going to set the date of the next meeting because we want it to be driven by the consideration of the building itself, like where we can take the drawings to so that we do have meaningful information to bring out rather than trying to you know, rush into something that um, uh, the designers aren't ready yet to, to present. So um, we will announce that meeting, but I don't want to give a date for when that would be yet but it will be as soon as I can get it to get, get, whip it down the road. That's as soon as I can get it together, I think. And then for those who are interested in other topics, I wanted to invite everyone to the HPAC meeting, the standing meeting, which is always on the fourth Wednesdays of, our, of the month. And that's the Highland Park Action Coalition. It, it takes um, kind of uh, advocacy for Highland Park, Riverview and South Delridge um, as its mission, and we try to build community in that. Of course, we're stuck on Zoom because we don't have a building to meet in, um, but uh, everyone's welcome to come to that event as well. Um, that There's a HPAC website, um, and um, I'll be sending out a, new, a little meeting link for that meeting too shortly. Uh, so I think that will conclude our event here unless I see any other pressing, raising of the hands or yelling. Um, and anybody who was kind enough to put a comment in chat, I do save those and we look through those as well. Um, so thanks for coming and thanks for being you Highland Park, we love you. Um, can't wait to sort of see you around. Thanks uh, Kay, thanks everybody. for everybody who organized thanks this opportunity. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Karen, thank you. Thanks. Uh -huh. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Mm -hmm. Bye bye now. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Matt. We so appreciate your comments. So helpful. So practical. Yeah. <laughs> you betcha. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Keeping us honest in Highland Park. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Super. All right, that's here. All right, just us chickens left here. Any thoughts? Oh, let's just stop the recording.